All right. Mr. Nail, could you uh, share the scripture reading with, with us for this morning? Um, yeah. Uh, good morning, guys. It's good to see you on video and for those who are watching live. Um, it's good to be with you guys tonight or this morning, uh, I should say. We're going to be in Psalm 119, verse 81 through 88. So the reading's going to come from Psalm 119, 81 through 88. It says, My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke. Yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. All your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. They have almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love, give me life, that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Um, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father God, um, in this time where um, we're separated, and I pray that you would comfort us, that you would come alongside and, and reveal yourself as the God of all comfort as Second Corinthians talks about. Um, I pray that we would find our, our hope and our joy um, in you and in our salvation that you have given us. Um, help us as a body to be um, encouraging uh, others through um, whatever means you provide. God, I pray that... Um, Though we are apart physically, that we would not be um, distant from each other, um, that we would not, um, in this time of um, being apart, God, I pray that um, we would not grow depressed or, or lonely, um, but we would um, be comforted by your promises. Like the psalmist says, I pray that we would trust and hope in them. Help us to, um, when, when times are rough, remember your word and that your word is going to come true. Um, so I pray that's where we find our hope and our trust and our joy. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It's um, back when I first started uh, teaching, Pastor Randy had uh, given me a good practice of going back and saying to go back and listen to your messages. And, and I thought it was horrible because I hated to hear myself talk. Um, but I have finally found something that I dislike even more than listening to myself talk. And that is watching myself talk. Uh, to go back and watch, uh, to watch it over again uh, is, uh, is, is hard. I just turn the computer around and listen. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, so new world. So good morning. Um, very glad that you're all here. Uh, I know that my glasses cause a little bit of a reflection. I apologize for that. Um, but uh, it's about the only way that I like to be able to read what's on my piece of paper. Um, I am trying to move back a little bit, hoping that it'll be a little less glare. Um, but I, I am grateful uh, for each and every one of you that were able to join, uh, whether you're joining by Facebook or you're joining by Zoom or you're joining by uh, uh, YouTube, or perhaps you uh, weren't able to join us uh, live and you are watching us at a later time. Um, we thank the Lord that you are here. Uh, we thank the Lord that uh, you will hear uh, from his word this morning, I hope. So let, let's see how this works. Uh, we'll see who types the fastest or speaks the fastest, but uh, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Wow, that was odd. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so, but anyway, it's, uh, it's good to say that. Um, it's true, as Dan is always saying, um, you know, we uh, serve a God who is sovereign, who is in control, uh, who knows the beginning from the end, and uh, we are very grateful uh, for that. And um, I just hope that all of us will remember that even in these trying times. <coughs> you know, even in this time of unprecedented separation, um, the trials of living in this fallen world continue unabated. Some of us are dealing with health issues unrelated to COVID-19. Some are dealing with the scourge of cancer. Some are dealing with the overbearing weight of loneliness and depression. And there are many more concerns that we deal with <coughs> that do not go away simply because we are quarantined or isolated or in Pinellas County, as we say, safe at home. These concerns and problems and worries, uh, both great and small, are only heightened by what we are going through currently. My heart is burdened and heavy for those who are struggling, regardless of the size of the struggle that you are going through. You know, it's um, interesting as I step into this chaos and mess uh, with a series on a book in the Old Testament named Amos. As I told you last week, um, this is not maybe perhaps one of the most encouraging books in the Old Testament. And um, as I was uh, studying this I, and writing down my notes and jotting uh, down my different notes that I had, um, I, I wrote down this note to myself. And it says, well, thank you very much, Pastor Joe, for this encouraging word when my world, our world, is in in need of tender words of compassion, not words of gloom, despair, and agony on me. Uh, some of you may recognize that last line. And this really caused me to step back and to really seek uh, the Lord's face um, and ponder and contemplate whether or not um, I was teaching what God really wanted me to teach. Uh, or was I just simply, uh, we had selected a book and I was going to simply teach on that uh, regardless. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sharing this um, for any other reason than to give you a window uh, into my heart and my longing, uh, which sometimes is overwhelming and, and oftentimes an inexpressible longing that I, I want to teach and lead God's people in a way that brings him honor and glory. Um, that I, I do not want it in, in any way um, to be about me. And um, as I was thinking about it, I, I, I realized that, you know, I, I don't want in any way, shape, or form in this series to heap burden upon burden or sorrow upon sorrow or guilt upon guilt. What I want to share is what God's been speaking into my heart and my mind through my study in the book of Amos. Now, this kind of leads me to my, my first point, and that is that uh, the word of God must be proclaimed when life is good, when life is hard, and even when unacceptable to the culture and God's people. In Amos chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, it says, for the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Romans 10, 14 through 17 tells us, how then will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Um, it's, it's interesting, as I was thinking of that, uh, it, it's not funny, but it is funny. Uh, my feet are not very beautiful. Uh, this has been an, an interesting week because I have twice uh, kicked a chair and my foot, I, I, I think I broke my toe. 
and uh, most of my foot is purple and uh, um, swollen um, and quite painful. But that verse made me uh, re be reminded that what makes the feet of those who bring God's word beautiful is not the person, it's the word of God. That is what makes it beautiful. And I, I felt even in this time when, when things are difficult, um, um, we need to hear God's word. Um, and I, I think it was James McDonald who said, the same sun that hardens the, the clay melts the wax. And, and I'm hoping that um, the messages uh, over the next coming weeks will be something that God will use in your heart, whether it's uh, today, um, tomorrow, or, or sometime in the future. So that being said, let's give a, a real short uh, review of what we did, covered last week. So previously in the book of Amos, uh, we are reminded that God is the one who is in charge. He's the one uh, that gets to set right and wrong. Uh, we are grateful that God chooses who he wants uh, to serve him, uh, even people that the rest of the world and even sometimes inside the body of believers may not think uh, is their choice. We rejoice that God is patient and loving. I, I rejoice so much that God is patient and loving. Um, and also that we should remind ourselves that um, God doesn't overlook sin. Um, that eventually sin will bring us to the point of discipline or judgment. Discipline for those who are believers, judgment for those who are not. <laughs> And also that God has made a way through Jesus Christ that we might live free from the fear of judgment. So as we get ready for the rest of the points, um, I, I want to remind us it's, it's interesting that, um, oh, I lost my piece of paper, um, that Amos chapters three through six are um, actually considered by most to be a series of three sermons, a series of three messages that God um, wanted um, Amos to share with his people, Israel. Um, now, I, I had first thought that I might uh, be able to get through it in one week, but uh, it's probably going to take me two, depending on how far we get today. Um, but uh, that's, that's hopefully what we'll get done. Um, it's been, uh, hopefully you had a chance to read through it. Um, I had thought about reading it this morning, uh, but having timed myself uh, both uh, two times, it was going to take me about 15, 20 minutes to read it. So um, I had decided that I wouldn't do that. But I would encourage you to, uh, to read Amos 3 through 6. Uh, a lot of really, really good stuff in that. Uh, and if you have any questions at all uh, as you read, just please let me know. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I will try to find out what the answer is through some more study. So here we go. I love this, this point here. What an inconceivable privilege we have. The nation of Israel, it says there in Amos 3, 2a, that you only have I known of all the families on earth. In Genesis chapter 12, we see where the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Through Abraham, God chose Abraham not because of his overwhelming righteousness, not because of any other reason than God chose him. And so the nation of Israel was and is God's chosen people. Now, remember what we talked about last week. This time in the nation of Israel's history and in Judah, uh, they were quite well off. Their, their kingdoms were doing well. They had lots of money. They, had, um, they were at ease with their neighbors um, to a certain extent. So they thought, you know, they were God's people, and therefore um, they were all good to go. Now, I do not believe that the church is the nation of Israel, and I understand some may disagree with that, and that's fine. Uh, I do not believe that the church has supplanted forever the nation of Israel, but I do believe that we are also chosen of God. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30 
reminds us that it says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Those who have come to Christ have come to Christ because the father has drawn us to him. He has given us as a gift, as a bride to his son. And it's, it's an incredible, just absolutely inconceivable privilege. Um, I, I actually, whenever I use the word inconceivable, I, I don't know what you guys think of, but I always think of the Princess Bride. Uh, the, um, I can't think of the little short guy's name, but the, the way he would say the word inconceivable. But it's really appropriate here because, you know, when you begin to think about what, what God has done in the lives of, of us as his children, how can I even begin to comprehend the incredible grace and mercy that he has shown to me, that he has shown to us? And I am so grateful that he has chosen me. And I, and I am so thankful that, as this says, tells us in John chapter 10, that Nothing can snatch me out of his hand. Not even I can snatch myself out of his hand. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10, it reminds us that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And what an incredible thing that that is. Now, Unfortunately, for the nation of Israel, Judah, and sadly, even for us um, on this uh, side of the cross, um, we need to realize that we are not immune to committing sin. And Amos chapter 3, verse 10a is an absolutely astounding statement from God through Amos to his people, telling them that they do not know how to do right. And what's interesting about that no is like they, they apparently don't have any inkling of how to do right. It reminds me a lot of the passage in Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32, where in verse 32 it says, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. It's interesting, this idea that they did not know how to do right does not mean that they were not instructed. It does not mean that the teachers of the law and that um, the, at the temple when they were worshiping that they were not taught right. They just had failed to process it. They were listening without hearing. We see in the New Testament Jesus was fond of saying, you know, let him who has ears, let him hear. Who has eyes, let him see. And we are reminded that just because um, we are believers does not mean that we can not fall into sin. It does not mean that we can begin to deceive ourselves into thinking that because we are believers, God does not care about our sin and that we can do whatever we want. I wanted to spend just a few moments here kind of looking over as we go through chapters three through six and even back to chapter one, what were some of the things that the nation of Israel was guilty of? Um, and now these, this is not a comprehensive list, um, but just uh, some of the highlights. I'm sure that there were a lot more um, sins that uh, could have been shared. In um, chapter one and two, we see that the nation of Israel was, uh, or the neighbors in the nation of Israel were uh, guilty of selling people into slavery. They were guilty of hypocrisy. Um, they were guilty of so many things. They desecrated tombs. They rejected the law of God. They were cruel to the poor. They were sexually immoral. They tempted godly people to sin. In, in chapters 3 through 6, we see here that they hated the truth, um, that they opposed good, that they're guilty of extortion or bribery. They were lazy and complacent, materialistic and indulgent, a nation of drunkards, uh, turned justice into poison. Um, they were arrogant. Um, uh, that verse 613, basically they had made a conquest and they took full credit for it. And they were like, look what I have done. Um, you know, and it reminds me of the verse, I should have looked it up, but I, I, I somehow got sidetracked. 
You know, who is the ax to say the one who wielded it, look what I have chopped. What ax can chop anything by itself without someone to wield it? It just lays there and eventually gets rusty and, and never can accomplish anything. So even for us, um, we are used by God in his hand, but we can never say anything um, that we do is not, that is apart from God, because if it is, then it is worthless. And then we also have here that they worship idols, uh, press the poor and crush the needy. Now, what was interesting to me as I, as I looked through this is, seems like a pretty accurate description of our world today. Um, you know, sometimes uh, people inside the church, uh, a lot of times people outside the church, we don't want truth. We want truth to be what we want it to be. Um, it's, uh, I can't remember now if we, it's something we talked about or if it's something that I um, interview, uh, something I had seen, you know, I've said before, I'm, I'm getting to be that age where I can't remember if I, I heard it, read it, said it, or hallucinated it, uh, one of those. Um, but in our culture, it's all about being able to make the choice. We do not want, as a culture, for there to be objective truth. We want to decide whether or not um, something is true. It's that old saying, it really has become a, a truth that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Which turns into, God said it, I don't believe it, therefore it really isn't true. When we know, or I know, that the truth is God said it, that settles it, now it comes whether or not I'm going to submit myself to it. And I will be honest, um, there, sometimes there are things in Scripture that I don't quite understand, but because God is far greater than I, because he is creator, he gets to set the objective standard of right and wrong, and it's my responsibility, my response to his grace and mercy in my life to bring myself under submission to his word. You know, in, in a sense, we are in a great time because we have God's completed word. If we want to know what's right and wrong, we can go and read it. And, and you know, there may be some questions for interpretation or application, but most of what we need to do in our lives is pretty clear. I mean, is there anyone who wonders about thou shalt not murder? You know, we shouldn't kill somebody. We shouldn't steal things. We shouldn't commit adultery. We, there's these things that we should not do and the only time we get into discussions is because there are things that fall into that realm that we want to do. You know, we are um, not above where the Jews were. You know, we are, uh, even though we are cooped up, um, isolated, semi-isolated, uh, depending if our family with our family units, um, honestly, we are still a very well-off people. Um, I know that... Uh, I've said it before, and uh, this may sound like a little bit of a broken record, and I apologize for that, but, you know, I, I have so much that I have things in my house that I will not eat. I have no idea how they got here, but I have food in my pantry that it would, I, you know, even desperate times, I'd probably give it away. Uh, what a time we live in when we, are, we know people all over this, not personally, but know people all over this world, and even in our own country, who don't have food to eat, uh, and other countries who go through dumps in order to get scraps. And so we should not think that we are somehow above where the Jews were in this time frame. So we need to, to remember that, um, that God does indeed set the standard. So the other thing that I was gleaning from this as we go through this is um, in Amos chapter 5, uh, verses 21 through 23, it says, I hate, I despise your feast. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. And the point is that external religious practice is a stench to God. Far too often, the, the, the God that we serve is put off by our worship because it smells like rotting flesh. We 
We think that we can live our lives any way that we want to during the week and even on the morning of gathering for worship and then enter into his presence and say a prayer and read a scripture and sing a few songs and suddenly he is somehow going to be pleased with that. You know, I'm grateful that I've, I've had the opportunity to be in a church that has so long taught the truth that, that God is concerned far more with our hearts, that the, the, the act of our, the external act of our worship may look a mess. It may sound not the most pleasing to our human ears, but if our hearts are right before God, if we are humble before him, if we are broken and contrite, our worship is a fragrant aroma to him. And this is something that Israel was really could not get a hold of. And Isaiah 1, 12 through 15 says, When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. And, you know, I, I will be honest with you, you know, I, I, I read verses like this and, and God really pierces me to my heart because I, I do not want for my worship to be an abomination to him. And in order for that to be true, I have to, in any other way, say that I have to constantly be evaluating myself. I have to constantly be evaluating my my um, motives of, of understanding where I am. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But it just, it's just, I, I want for us, for myself, for my family, for us as a, a local manifestation of, of God's body to do right. Now, now, understand my heart. None of us are perfect. Um, it would be a lie to tell you that there have not been uh, times when I basically had to drag myself to the assembly because my heart was not where it needed to be. But I rejoice that God would deal with me. And I cannot remember a time that coming to the end of a time of a gathering that I was not lifted up. It's one of the things that I, I truly uh, miss about being on the music team. Um, what an incredible time on Thursday night to have struggled through a day and to come together with uh, my brothers and sisters and, and to have the Lord get my heart right as we share requests together, as we talk, as we laugh together, and as we sang, God would right my heart and I would humble myself before him, grateful for his mercy. So please don't ever think that you have to be perfect in order for God to accept your worship. Uh, the scripture is clear. Jesus was a man like us. He understands. He was tempted. He just did not sin. He, he understands the struggles. He saw the struggles that people went through. He understands. So it's not a matter of perfection. It's a matter of wanting to do what God wants us to do and, and realizing there are times when we have just failed miserably but God and Jesus, Holy Spirit, are not there holding us down. They are there lifting us up if we would just let them. And so, you know, even in your own homes, um, you know, that our, our words and our deeds um, would be in accord with what his word says. And then when we do gather together, whether it's in the same place uh, or whether it's like this in a virtual way, that our worship is something that God says it is a pleasing aroma. I love your worship. I appreciate your coming before me. I will listen to you. And that's such an incredible thing. And we thank God for his grace through Jesus Christ that we have that opportunity. Now, one thing for me that I'm also reminded of that we, we do have this incredible, inconceivable privilege 
but we have to realize that with this privilege comes a tremendous responsibility. This is not in any way to be interpreted or construed to be legalism, legalistic, but it's a reality. God says in his word that if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you love me, you will love each other. If you don't, then my word is not in you. In Amos 3, 2, it says here, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Now, it's interesting. I, I don't think I covered it before, but the word therefore I have known um, you of all the families is, is that idea of that intimate knowing that a husband and wife have. This is not a cursory knowing. This is a deep knowing. And, and in a sense, it's that, you know, God knows that they know the truth, which makes their sin all the more egregious. And, and we need to understand that, and, and we looked at it last week, that, you know, yes, we live in the age of grace. And I am so incredibly grateful for that. Yet, even in the New Testament, we are reminded that he brings discipline to those who are his children, to those that he loves, that he will, those who have not accepted Christ, will face punishment. Israel knew this in Deuteronomy 11 and in Deuteronomy 28. It says, you know, you get the curses if you do not obey the commandments of, our, of the Lord your God. Um, but if you turn aside um, in Deuteronomy 20, it says, but if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you to overtake you. I think sometimes we mistakenly think that because we live in the age of grace that we don't worry about sin. And yet I, I love the teaching of Pastor Randy when he would teach the the passage about Paul that says, you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And, and Paul, in the most emphatic way, says, may it never be. And in my heart, I, I just like, you know, Lord, may I never want to do that. May I never want to sin simply because I'm under grace. Um, but sadly, it, it's true. There are, you know, sometimes we fall into sin. Sometimes we walk into sin. Other times we plan, conspire, and run into sin. And uh, Father, forgive us when we do that, because that is not what grace is about. You know, it's interesting in, in 1 Corinthians, it uh, talks about us as believers. It says, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on, the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. What an incredible, and, and to me, it, you might see the negative of that, but I see the wonderful positive of that. You know, it, I want to do uh, the things that God wants me to do that I'll have something that survives. But my salvation is not dependent upon my building. It's dependent upon God. And I love the thing it says, and though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, listen, uh, you guys know me well enough. This, this is not a time for you to say like, well, I'm getting in. Uh, so, uh, not worried about it. That, that's not what this verse is trying to teach us, but you know what? Sometimes we, we were doing things and we're like, man, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I believe I'm doing this for the right reasons. But I just don't know. But the reality is we do the best we can. And on that day though, we may feel like we've suffered loss. We will be saved because our salvation, those who come to Jesus Christ as Lord and savior, our salvation is dependent upon him and him alone. It is not dependent upon us. It is not dependent upon our works. It is not dependent upon how well we do those works. It is completely dependent upon him. And so I would, I would ask that whenever we do anything, that we would remember that and that we would do our best. But understand, your salvation is not based upon that. So as we, we come towards the end of this, 
I was, I was thinking through this uh, passage in, and I, and I know that sometimes I think, well, it's, you know, maybe not the most encouraging thing in the world, but whenever I, I, I do studies like this, God always leads me to Psalm 139. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me. You know, this probably is a very unique, unique time for us to have a season of introspection and reflection. Um, a time when um, even if we're cooped up at home, we can find some place that we can be alone and we can, we can cry out to God and, and have those times when we can just say, God, please show me what's in my heart. Please show me the things that no one else can see but you. Because I know even in my own heart that I have deceived myself into thinking I have right motives and, and in times alone with God, he has corrected me. And I am grateful for that because he's correcting me for my betterment um, so that I, in some small way, can be used for his honor and glory. And so it's an incredible thing to have this time where we can, can look to him and say, God, would you please search me? Would you please reveal to me the thoughts that even I don't understand or that I'm not comprehending? And and really, the last point here is, is my plea, because I love the way Psalm 139, 23, and 24 ends. It says, lead me in the way everlasting. I so love that. It, it's, it's not at all about God, us re- asking God to reveal our hearts and him leaving us there wallowing in our, our doubt and, and, and brokenness, but it's that idea that he's going to lead us in the way everlasting. If you are separated from Christ, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we had looked at before, he is not slow as some uh, deem slow, but he is patient that all might come to repentance. And so I would beg, I would plead with you to ask him to lead you into the way everlasting, to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior. In Romans 3, 21 through 26, and I've just got part of it here, says the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. If you are separated from Christ, please do not look at those who are in Christ and think that we were somehow better. We, we were horrible. I was, a not, I was not worthy of being saved. And yet, God, through his Son, by the drawing of the Holy Spirit, led me to the way everlasting. And by accepting Christ as my Savior, I have redemption by his blood. As Dan will say, you know, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And, and that is so true. We, we cannot think that we can be saved of our own accord or of our own uh, wisdom. That is only through this incredible gift that we receive by faith. And so my plea for us, whether we are, are apart from Christ or in Christ, is that we would ask God, you know, search us, know us, but then lead us into the way of truth lead us into your, to his joy, lead us into his abundant life. It doesn't mean that we will be perfect. Um, it doesn't mean that we will be sinless. Um, for some, it may be a while before we even sin less, but God, as long as he tarries, as long as we are here, will continue to work on us. And so my prayer for us as, as, as our, in our families and as a body of Christ that, that we would want to honor him, that all that we do would be a fragrant aroma to him, and that we, along with him, would make this plea to those around us who are in need of a Savior. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I, I thank you for your word. Um, forgive me if I have misconstrued or wrongly interpreted or, or applied something. Lord, I pray that you will do what only you can do in your power and your might. 
Lord, I pray that as we are cooped up here in our homes, that we will find ways to honor you, that we will find ways to encourage one another. And Father, we do pray for those that are going through incredible trials of, of health issues, of, of being lonely, of, of not having anyone around. Um, Lord, would you give them the boldness to reach out? Lord, would you bring to our hearts and minds someone that we could reach out to them, that we would be faithful? Lord, we pray for those who are in the medical field, those who have been working long and difficult hours. Um, we thank you for people like Jeremy who um, go into the hospital every time they're scheduled and, and do their job to the best of their ability. We pray for the protection of their health. Lord, we pray that they will have opportunities in their, their jobs. So that we thank you for the grocery store workers and, and the police officers, the, the firemen, um, the EMT who are, are out there working hard at putting themselves at risk. Lord, I pray for the leaders of our country, the leaders of the world, that they would continue to make fact-based decisions Lord, that um, acrimony would be put aside, or that we would, um, Lord, first and foremost, that they would know you, or that they would come to an understanding of who you are. That's uh, far greater than being a good leader is to, uh, to be your child. But Lord, we do ask that they would make good decisions. Father, help for us that are at home to do what we're asked to do, Lord, I, I, in my heart, do not believe this is a situation where the government is trying to um, unnecessarily restrict us. But Father, we want to show compassion and love to the people around us. And that um, compassion and love to those who, who are leading us, uh, that it would not be a horrible thing to have to lead us. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this technology. I, I thank you for all of this that we can share together. Lord, may you use this in our lives. And Lord, may we have good discussions. It's in your precious name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Um, so let's see if I can figure this out. Uh, or not. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, there we go. Stop.